Okay, welcome everyone. Um, we are here for the seminar by Shen Ming. Uh, she got her degrees in mechanical engineering from Yunnan University and then uh, studied uh, bioacoustics at Virginia Tech. Um, and then uh, she went to um, uh, Brown, where she is now as a postdoc. And um, there, um, uh, she's been working on modeling the auditory system of big brown bat and acoustic scene reconstruction as part of a MIRI project. Her longer term goal is uh, to design sonar for small autonomous vehicles, aerial vehicles, and incorporate AI in precise sensing. Um, she was she has been selected as a speaker for the Neuroscience Institute's Rising Star postdoctoral seminar series. Uh, at the University of Chicago uh, with her research in biostatistics. So over to you, Chen. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm Chen Ming, a postdoc at Brown, and today I will tell you my research around echolocating bats. So this picture shows a big brown bat and it's palm size in 20 grams, um, not so big as, as big as your screen. Um, there are 850 species of echolocating bats. They have different sonar signals. This is again a, a big brown bat. They emit sound from their mouth and then listen to the returning echoes from whatever object in the front that's in the uh, range of their beam. And then by analysis, they will um, find a navigation path and also the target of interest, their preys. This is um, bottlenose dolphin. The sound is out from the phonic lips that is three centimeters under the blowhole and uh, they receive the returning echoes from their lower jaw. Uh, it's common, echolocation is common in dolphins, purposes in toothed whales. Here are two videos to show big brown bats, they snatch uh, the prey in the dark around the forest. Oh. Here, this one. See the mouth here. And then this one is eight times slower. This is the mouth. So the sound isn't right. So you, you should have heard the chirping sound. That's the down sampled sound of echolocating calls. Their echoing call spans from 20 kilohertz to 100 kilohertz, which is above our hearing range from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. And um, um, then here are a few examples of engineered sonars. Uh, this is an underwater robot and that's equipped with size scan sonar. This one is used to search the missing plant from Malaysia. MH370, uh, and this is a side scan sonar image of a fallen plant uh, from 1950s. It's on the bottom of Lake Ontario. This is more da daily, common daily use. Uh, you see the ring-like structures in front and the back of your car. That's the sonar sensor measures the distance between, uh, between the, uh, your car and the object. Oh, is it, oh, and is the presentation all right? Yeah, most of us can see it, uh, I, only Matt seems to have problems, so go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, so why, um, here. So why am I, I'm studying biosonar? Some people say, hey, those engineers sonar, they work great. I agree the the underwater robot, they can be uh, searching for hours and hours and they provide high resolution sonar image. But the biosonar is, it operates in real time and it's very efficient. For the use that I'm thinking for uh, observation of forest fires that can be done by a small drone and go out, fly for two hours and tell me, is there any fire uh, going on in the 20 miles long forest range? That kind of short uh, real-time 
mission, which is not common in engineered sonars. And this is uh, a military use that it's an airborne sonar can be carried by a, a helicopter and dip into the water to detect submarines. The line of this talk will be uh, the first that will um, discuss the a far foliage echo model that I developed to quantify the acoustic properties because as the two videos you've seen that the forest is so common in their, uh, while they're hunting and they navigate tens of miles from roosts to the hunting site and each night. So uh, how do they analyze the forest echoes? And also the behavior research I've done with deep learning about the bats and then the auditory system model I developed that can suppress clutter and identify the target. Foliage is important um, to echolocating bats. In previous study only has done some field work that they measured the echoes from a few different species and compared the st uh, statistical properties of those echoes and did some classification. But what if we want to simulate an acoustic scene that when the bat approaches, just like this, when the bat approaches this tree, what's the echo um, it receives look like? So I use three parameter density, radius and orientation to describe the tree. And the assumption here is the, the leaves, the uh, distribute, this is the first version, uh, the leaves distribute uniformly in a space. And um, and we start with the sonar beam pattern because it's, it's mo monostatic, meaning this emitter and the receiver are at the same spot. So the sonar send out a signal, depends on where the leaf is. It receives, it receives different amplitude from the sonar. And then uh, how much sound does one leaf uh, reflect back? That depends on where the sonar is in the coordinate system of the specific leaf. To quantify that, we need to calculate leaf beam pattern after the leaf is in sonified. So um, we can do, I won't go through every word in this slide. The scatter fields can be calculated with this equation and then the far field coefficient can be expressed with spheroidal wave functions of many order, kind, and degrees. So there's a book in software dedicated to the solutions of spheroidal wave functions. Um, this is the exact solution of the uh, leaf beam pattern coefficient I got, and it's very close to cosine function because the calculation of the exact solution takes a long time. So I used cosine function to mimic this. And then, then we can determine of this leaf uh, will return this much sound to this direction, to the sonar. And uh, the length, it's just for illustration. So the length of the arrow is um, this, the amplitude of, of the sound. And this leaf, because the sonar is to the side of this leaf, so if the sonar is to the side, it re reflects less back to the sonar and it will reflect only less uh, sound than this one. And every leaf will have a sound return back to the sonar and we add them together. There's, uh, here comes an echo received at the same spot as the emitter. Um, this, um, that are spats, they learn to classify conifers from brown leaf trees. So now I have a bunch of simulation echoes. Can I estimate what tree is this echo from? What's the density, radius, and orientation that calls that can uh, cause this echo? So I used a lasso regression, a uh, um, machine learning method, to extract uh, features from every single echo. Uh, this case, this is the amplitude feature. I divide them into ten parts and. Uh, used uh, histogram and quantiles. And then this is a time-wise uh, feature. I measured the time intervals between peaks. Anything longer than 0 0.02 millisecond will uh, stay. And then the distribution and quantiles, a total of 40 features, including the time feature and the amplitude feature are used to train the lasso regression. 
And the result is for one unknown, meaning uh, in this case, the for the left uh, panel, the radius and orientation is known. And uh, I set those two parameters and produce a bunch of echoes using different densities and put them into training and test with unseen data. And also use the same radius and orientation, but unseen density. So the lasso regression performs well. Um, it performs well for other two parameters in one unknown case. But if we have two unknowns that um, for the left top figure, I, I said, the radius, mean radius to be 15 millimeter and um, uh, varies the density and uh, orientation to produce many echoes and put them to training. And then I get some echoes that has different density and orientation, but the same radius, the model performs, the, the train lasso regression perform okay. Uh, there, my colleagues worked on this and published another paper using other method to estimate the parameters. The bats, they use um, foliage echoes as landmarks. So we think, can we estimate the, the parameters as well? That's the purpose of this study. Um, but that, that was assuming the leaves are distributed in uniformly in the space, but trees, they grow uh, uh, along the branches. There are clusters. So I used a Linda Mayer system uh, and pick two examples, pie and ginkgo, as an example of conifer and broadleaf trees, and built the branching patterns using Lindemayer system. I use two sets of uh, branches, but one set is not dense enough. So I lift the original set, the original one is brown, and I lift it and rotate 90 degrees and attach to the original set of branches. So that's dense enough to mimic the real trees on campus. And then I add leaves according to um, pine and ginkgo's leaf structure. And now I'm ready to um, create acoustic scene, how that evolves. So this is the beam and this is the bat as it evolves, uh, goes near the tree, this is a echo. And this one is for pine. You see, because the branching patterns are different, the leaves engage in the beam. There are stripes in for the pine, but uh, big patches for the um, ginkgo. And I also create uh, different scenarios, but not included in this presentation. Then I'll introduce the behavioral uh, research I've done using deep learning uh, since I joined Brown University. So can we track the flight, flight path of bats without using markers. This is an experiment to test. The question is, will the bats be startled by sudden noise from random combination of speakers? There are three speakers, one, two, and three. Um, at any time when bats is, the bats is released from X point, and while it's in flight in the chain corridor, the chains are hanging from ceiling all the way to the floor. At some time when it's in the corridor, um, sound will be triggered from any combination of the three loudspeakers. And will the bed suddenly change its flight path, which we call startled? So, so I used a uh, deep web cut, a, a newly, at that time it's 2018, newly developed uh, software using ResNet um, to label those, um, the head, wing, and uh, your elbow without making markers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Before we tried using markers, it's very difficult for the experimenter to paint a marker on the bed and you have to remove it after each experiment. Also, uh, or you can use stickers, which is even trickier. And then you have used ton of lights. We want to conduct the experiment in the dark using infrared light because we want to exclude the possibility that bats use light. Um, but it's very tricky and it's never ideal. So then this deep learning tool came out that no markers needed, needed. And even this video quality is enough. So I use, uh, you can see oh, the trained, by trained network, the cross are labeled by the trained network. And those uh, dots are labeled by me and they're just as accurate as me. And their study showing that 
the accuracy of the labels by Trent Network is as accurate as humans. And I used two cameras and each of them, um, those are the results from deep lab cut. And when the LED lights, five of them are lit, that's when the sound is triggered. So there are confusions by the network for the right wing when there's overlap between the experimenter and the bat. We later improved by using darker gowns. Um, and after calibration of the two stereo cameras, uh, we can get the 3D trajectory of this uh, body parts based on the, the location, the actual location uh, according to this flight room. This is the synchronized, uh, the two cameras must be synchronized as well. Um, frame to frame. And also the picture, the calibration pictures were taken at the same time as well. And those are the calibration results. So it, it finds the coordinate system of the cameras in, uh, and they use one camera as origin. And then this is me holding the checkerboard. Uh, those are the position of the checkerboard. And now this is the left is uh, one flight and right is the head, only head, because the head is always uh, stable. So the, there's no confusion about this. And this is a head moving in this chain corridor. And this right, uh, the red dot is when the sound was triggered. So you can see this trial, at least the bat was not startled. And uh, I excluded those uh, not accurate labels and reconstruct their flight in this. So in each label by the neural network, there will be a likelihood number. Usually when, when it's accurate, the likelihood number is very high. When it's not, it's, so it's very low. You can set a threshold and exclude those unwanted labels. And those are some examples from one bet on that day. And I can see their flight, flight path did not change. So they don't care the, the sound, the sound from any combination of speakers. They were designed to mask certain parts of their echolocation sound, but they seem not care. And then the third part is the identification of target from clutter. Like this is common scene in while the bats are hunting, the, the, the moth is anywhere in the tree line and it has to sort out the echo of the moth from the clutter echoes. The clutter is unwanted uh, targets and then exclude those, only sort out this moth and find out how far away it is, overall delay and how big this moth is, a glint delay. Glint is one major reflecting point. And this is called clutter suppression. And this is target identification. So I developed a model after auditory system of big brown bats to, that is capable of clutter suppression and target identification. This is a um, scan of um, bats brain. And here you see those big spaces. This is a cochlea. If you cut in the middle, that's um, what it's like. And the cochlea process the time series of the signal into frequency domain. Uh, for big brown bats, it's split into 20 kilohertz to 100 kilohertz into many parallel frequency band. And then the amplitude of each frequency band is passed uh, from the hair cells to uh, through the auditory nerve to the brain. So the cochlea is the transducer of signals and the brain will do signal processing. And the SCAT model uh, try to mimic this whole process. The stage one is from uh, a, every time when the big brown bats emit a call, it will make a copy, save a copy in the brain. And then when the echoes start to come back, it will compare the saved copy of FM pulse with any echo. Because the echo carries the structure information of 
the target. So for example, an, an apple of an apple is different from an apple of a banana. It's all in this, this echo here. And then the best task is to read the structure from the echo. And then this will be passed into a gamma tone filter bank. Gamma tone filter is a very common auditory filter. And then from 20 to 100 kilohertz, and this is the FM pulse. FM is uh, frequency modulated, the pulse of the bands and this the echo. Um, you see there are two major parts, uh, we call one and two, it's harmonics. This is the first harmonic and this is the second. It's, it's that way because of the specific a vocal cord structure of big brown bats. And then uh, you see those alternating uh, patterns in the FM echo, like we call those darker spots, uh, spherical, uh, spherical peaks in those uh, lighter spots, notches. So it's uh, alternating pattern because well, when a moth or insect, they're too small, and they have uh, two big wings or uh, two big wings and a big body. They are alter alternating and then they're so close together, their echoes will interfere. And then that's causing those alternating patterns. That carries important information. So if we can identify the location of the spher uh, spherical, spherical notches, we can find now the spacing between the two major reflecting points. And that's what SCAT model will later do, I'll introduce later. And then the, the way to do that is to find, is to transform the amplitude into time domain. So I used a threshold to measure the first inset uh, of the waveform with that threshold for the pulse and for the echo. So you see as at the stronger point, uh, at the darker is um, stronger amplitude at the peaks it measures the time lapse of uh, between the pulse and echo, but while it's at the notches, the time lapse seems strong, uh, seems longer. That's called amplitude latency trading effect. For example, if I'm I close my eyes, I'm listening to a music music player, and someone come in to the room and uh, turn down the volume, then I will my perception would be uh, someone took it and. Uh, stepped away from me. So the perception of amplitude will cause longer latency perception. Yeah, that's the amplitude latency trading effect. And that's what we later use to uh, pinpoint the notch positions. So uh, after doing the uh, threshold crossing for all frequency bands and also align the threshold crossing of the FM pulse on the line that's parallel to the Y axis, we can de-chirp the spectrogram, meaning put them on a, a straight line uh, parallel to Y axis. And you see those uh, amplitude latency trading effect is the strongest at the notch point because the notch is not just one frequency band that's uh, very weak than others. It's a swath uh, of frequency bands and one for uh, the center frequency band is the weakest. So it, it, all the, if you add all, I use 10 thresholds, if you put them together, it was, you will see those scallop-like structures. That's where I, I identify the notch position and map them onto the delay on uh, the triangular network that has the delay neurons to uh, mimic the auditory cortex processing. So those amplitude latency caused a significant delay of those notches. And then they activate the neuron on the delay neuron, the triangular network. And then all of them will uh, give a distribution of the frequency difference of neighboring frequency bands of the notches that in the reciprocal of that is the glint spacing. That's one micro, 100 microsecond, which is 1.7 centimeter. And the uh, lowest threshold uh, gives accurate estimation of the overall delay, six millisecond, meaning the target is six millisecond away from the sonar. So send out signal, save a copy, and then heard the echo from the mouth. 
then the two information can be summarized on one paragraph. The x-axis overall delay and then the glint delay is on the back wall of x, uh, z axis. That's the percept, that's how we describe the perception of the bats. Can the scat model process real fluttering moth echoes? This is a Wimby cycle of the a fluttering mouth and sound source is at, is the at my locations as I speak to the screen, and the mouth is at this location receiving sound from me, and then I receive the echo of uh, the mouth, and it's the it's cut out like only the echoes of the mouth is shown here without the the broadcast. And echo fourteen to eighteen has very interesting structures. So I put them through scat model and give, uh, the scat model can estimate the spacing between two uh, reflecting surfaces on the moth. It's, um, it's shifting and it gets smaller as the, bat, as the moth flaps its wings. Uh, one major uh, capability of the bats is uh, clutter suppression, meaning that the clutter will not cause confusion of the bat of the uh, tracking of the target of interest. How did they do that? Is their beam? This is a beam um, of the echolocation beam, and their beam has a width that meaning only this part, this angle, is strongest. As it goes to the side, it gets weaker. And then by always aiming at the target of interest, which is the prey, the prey gets the strongest uh, strongest sound from the best biosonar all the time, and thus retaining the strong the full spectrum. Because the higher the frequency is, the narrower the beam is. So as uh, goes when the beam the frequency goes to eighty and a hundred kilohertz, it probably only this wide. And then those leaves will not receive much sound. That causes a low pass filtering effect. And those, the high frequencies of the clutter is missing. And that's how scan model can suppress the clutter echoes. Here is an example of dolphin clicks. Uh, this is the broadcast and target echo. This target is always at the center, thus receiving the full spectrum. But the clutter echo it has the is low pass filtered. The high about 30 kilohertz is missing. And then we use the threshold and find all the insects. You see, because the low pass filtering, because of the weaker amplitude, it calls longer latency estimation. And then it's kind of turning to the right. And thus this will activate a a swath of dealing neurons on the triangular network. And for the target echo, the estimation of the glint spacing is prominent. It's very sharp peak on the back wall, but the perception of the, tar uh, of the clutter is uh, fuzzy, meaning that it's, the peak is not prominent. So by activating more dealing neurons, the perception of that is actually not very strong. So, that's how scan model does clutter suppression inspired by the echolocating bats. Another capability of uh, echolocating bats is they are able to uh, solve pulse echo ambiguity. This is an experiment that we released the bat into a room full of hanging chains. Um, so the environment is very crowded for them. We have an um, ultrasonic microphone on the back wall and then receive the, the echo and uh, also the pulse when the bat is flying in the flight room. This is um, um, part of the recording from this red line. This is call number one and the echoes of call number one spans from this point all the way here. And, then the back emit call number two, the echoes spans from this point to the end. 
you notice that after call number two, there are two echoes from call number one still coming back to the backs. This will be hard to resolve because for cross correlation, the call number one and call number two, they are very similar. So those two echoes will can be identified as the echo of call number two, and thus they are very close target that requires the bat to take action immediately. So how does bat um, can discard those two echoes? They use uh, this phenomenon is pulse echo ambiguity, and they will, the perception of those wrong echoes is called phantom targets. And then they use frequency hopping. You notice that the call number two had the tail end frequency of call number two is about five kilohertz lower than the call number one. And by finding, by finding the echoes of after call number two, uh, about the five kilohertz to match the call number two, they couldn't find those. So then those are rejected. In SCAT model, uh, I develop a module to mimic that capability. Uh, this is pulse number two. And by actively looking for the tail end frequency to match the pulse, if the echo of pulse uh, one does not have the lowest five-ish kilohertz frequency, then it will be rejected by the SCAT model. And then that the, will not appear in the later process. Mm, the ongoing work uh, is I used a convolutional neural network in binaural localization. So here is uh, uh, an experiment done by Cindy's lab. At T1, when the bat is flying in the flat room at T1, there's a mealworm released from the ceiling that has been hiding. And then at T2, the bat found the mealworm. And since that, since that moment, they starts to fly toward the mealworm and then send out the pulses, the, each the black short line is a pulse aiming at the mealworm. So I want to mimic this process. And at the same time as the bat approaches the target, and I, uh, I assume the target is a two gland target. So two gland is one gland, two gland. And the perception of the location of the two gland will change as well. So can, what, how can I uh, localize the two glints that are only five centimeters apart and the, the bed is a, about a meter away and approaches the target? So I use uh, a convolutional neural network. So this is a video of the simulation. And the estimation here is done by the, the train network. And this is the sensor motor part. The, um, the dot is the real uh, location and the cross is the estimation. The blue line is the flight vector. So um, I, for training, I used uh, from zero degree, five degree increment all the way to 180 degree. And the bed is 100 centimeters away from the target. The target is five centimeter uh, wide. This is uh, a zoom in picture of the training. And I used a different pulse length as a variation. And at post uh, position two, the training data is generated, uh, it's cochleogram, it's widely used in the human auditory research in deep learning. Uh, they use the cochleogram to train the, um, the localization of the target in front of a mannequin. And this pulse two, and because pulse two, uh, position two and position 37, they're quite similar, so I add one, uh, column of interaural level difference to distinguish those two. The past research I've done um, the foliage echo model to um, quantify the, the echoes from vegetation. And I've done the behavior research using deep learning to for markerless tracking and the computer vision for the 3D trajectory reconstruction. And also I did 
de uh, designed active sensing algorithm modeled after auditory system of big brown bats that can realize some of their capabilities. And in the future, I want to um, expand the behavioral research on individuals with ASDs. Uh, for example, characterize the social scenes. Can I develop um, a diagnosis tool by only putting a few cameras in a room and let parents and their babies interact and just analyze those videos? Can I give a diagnosis yet? Yeah, this is an individual with ASD, but using deep learning. And I also want to build a sonar on the chip for small autonomous drones. Uh, to mimic the, the biosonar capabilities. And I also want to use AI to find the cues for decision-making and navigation. Here's an example. This is the activation map uh, in, from the previous ongoing project. So the darker spots, meaning that it's important, uh, it has higher weight, it will be passed on to the next level neurons. And we have uh, cognitive experiments. I want to build parallel learning models of um, the bats in deep learning and peek into the activation map and find out the simple cues they use. Have uh, for several ideas of proposals um, because this is a great opportunity with the USAND Center. And uh, those, those are the experiments done by other researchers using deep lab cut. So this is the dilating pupil of a mice. So you can track to that degree of uh, precision. And this is also a markerless tracking example. So uh, I know uh, the eye tracking is going on in Dr. Oh, let me get the name right. Jessica Brett Shaw's lab. And then um, I wonder if we can use virtual reality goggles to record more eye movement to pinpoint the eye movement using deep lab cut. And then another idea is to characterize the social scenes uh, developing the diagnosis tool for early diagnosis, which can have great benefits to, for, um, for those individuals. And this is their learning models, the big brown bats. Um, um, it's called two alternative force choice that's going on uh, in our lab. And also there's parallel experiments of this for bottlenose dolphins. It's a cycle physical experiment used to measure the specific perception experience or, uh, of the echolocating bats. So they are trained to identify one target over another. And then in the data collection stage, uh, the, the experimenters manipulate one of those uh, choice, the, the, the choice they are trained to choose, and then see when they fail. So I want to, because all the pulses and uh, uh, return echoes are recorded, I want to use them to develop the learning models using deep learning, and then peek into the activation map and see if that can inspire um, the design of efficient and accurate sonar algorithm. The current uh, Murray program, program I'm in is the program officer is always asking the question, can we find some simple cues, a simple algorithm to improve the design of Navy sonar? So that's, I think this project will suit that um, requirement. And, um, this is the acoustic scene we've seen before. The, and also this is the sonar head I built in PhD studies. So that was four or five years ago and technology has developed so much during the five years. And I want to build a sonar on the chip. And for the forest fire observation, it may not be that hard because as the um, objects or the obstacles, they are simple. So just the idea is to make the drone fly along the canopy of the forest and equip them with thermal cameras and smoke detectors. And when, if there are some trees that does, uh, it's taller than the, the average canopy, then it has to avoid that obstacle. And other than that, it's pretty simple from, 
position A to B while maintaining certain distance. That's uh, later on, I want to expand one drone into a swarm of drones so we can cover large ground. And the, for the bigger um, project for the Korea award, I want to device uh, sonar on the chip and uh, corresponding softwares algorithms to make it um, of it capable to fly in a complicated environment. For example, the city that has utility poles, buildings and trees and everything. And um, I also want to build a counterpart underwater because sonar sensing is classic perception ways in uh, underwater environment. This is um, um, pulse density modulation microphone. It has less components in smaller size that can be part of the, the sonar on the chip project. Um, <clears throat> this opportunity is exciting because uh, University of South Carolina has so many great collab potential collaborators for behavior research on uh, autistic individuals for decision-making models in deep learning and for autonomous, <clears throat> excuse me, for autonomous learning and for the Jones Swarm. And I will talk to some uh, of people I listed here. I'm very excited. Um, acknowledgement is my lab at Brown University, my PIs and uh, friends here, and those, uh, also the collaborators from the MURI program. It's their support uh, and that has raised me up here. And the funding resource from ONR and NSF for my postdoc and uh, PhD studies. And any questions? Uh, Chen is Mike Humes. Um, I'm really impressed at how amazingly thorough your study is where you're, uh, you're modeling uh, both the, the signals, the clutter, uh, the prey, uh, the uh, cochlear uh, physiology of the bats. Uh, that's all great. Uh, as far as the prey, um, do you model anything about the trajectory of the moths? So for example, I've heard that uh, to evade bats, um, moths can't fly very fast. On the other hand, thanks to gravity, they can fall very fast. And so if they uh, hear a, a, a bat's chirp, they'll just simply start, stop falling and fall. Uh, and so I just wondered if you ever took things like that into account. Oh, that's a great question. Actually, I think that's, you can see that in, in the, the video, this video, the bat, uh, the moth did fall. The, okay, it happened year. so quick, I couldn't tell. <laughs> it's hard to see, it did fall. And uh, for the current sensor motor model, I did not include that because I assume they are still to simply just study the echolocating function of the bats, but it will be great uh, in the future, I will include those into consideration. There are models where the, the moth can kind of randomly uh, move, but not purposefully uh, evade the, the bats. But that's a great point. I think I will include in the future research to study the interaction. I have an, an idea about a ground robot I want to do um, sort of uh, similar to that idea is the beam locking. So the bats, you're able to lock your beam on the moth. I want to build, so put a moth on a, um, one robot car and uh, put the sonar on another robot car and chase the, the moth around in the room. And I think that would be fun to do. Uh, maybe a quick follow-up. Uh, have you considered um, jamming the moths? Uh, this is more related to, uh, you know, maybe some of the future DOD applications you were <laughs> thinking about. Um, so do you ever consider, you know, sending false signals to, um, uh, you know, like more clutter where there's, there's no trees or uh, anything of that sort? Oh, I have not, but that will be great. Can you give more details about that uh, aspect? Uh, well, 
you know, you could have something that would um, receive the bat signal and then send it back uh, that's modulated in some way that would make the return signal appear to be uh, more targets, uh, different targets, uh, clutter, uh, you know, more trees, um, things of that sort, and see if the bat could distinguish those or how it would deal with those. And maybe that would help, uh, uh, you know, other uh, systems, uh, you know, surveillance systems deal with, uh, fake returns. Oh, wow. I haven't thought about that. It's, it's, it sounds very interesting. Uh, Jen, I have a question. This is the bluff. Hi. Um, hi. My question is, so first, thanks for a, a great talk. A very, oh, thanks. Uh, very illuminating. Uh, my question is, how could this line of work be helpful for um, uh, visually impaired people? Right, and oh. most of them are uh, actually restricted in closed environments. Okay, most of the technologies, but in an open uh, environment, uh, they can just go to like a park and uh, or in open spaces. Right, it could help them navigate. So I was just wondering, how could uh, a work like this uh, help uh, visually impaired, for example? That's a great um, question. Um, I know there are canes that uh, carries the sonar sensor. And I also have my person, uh, personally have an idea that I'm terrified of uh, going across the streets. I want some drone just fly above me as a guardian and then just alert me if there are cars coming and or some big thing I need to um, pay attention to. <laughs> Hi Chen, um, this is Forrest. Thanks for the Hi, Forrest. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I just had a question about um, echolocation versus using vision for applications like um, monitoring forest fires. Do you know mm. any trade-offs between the two? Um, oh, trade-off. I think probably when it's in the day, use computer vision. That that computer vision, the vision does provide. Oh, the vision does provide more update, like quicker update, is continuous update as we look around. But the echolocation is beep, beep, beep. The, the, the bats use fast, uh, short interpulse interval, meaning they can send signal with uh, a few milliseconds uh, interval, but it's still not as efficient. But in the dark, then it will be the sonar more useful as if the development of computer vision at right now still difficult to process the the, the kind of image in the dark even used into uh, infrared lights and infrared cameras okay thank you um hi chen and uh, this is sanjeev here hi. uh great talk um so my question has a two part. Uh, the first one is, have you tried to consider using uh, a synthetic aperture or an inverse synthetic aperture method to get a better three-dimensional image? And the second part is, have you tried any comparison with uh, an RF-based method, like using millimeter wave, uh, even lower frequency RFs? Oh. Oh, can I ask the uh, clarify has clarify the first question? What what's in the three D uh, reconstruction? Uh, yeah, so I was thinking like as a bat is moving or flying around in space and time, or even the target is flying around in space and time, you can gather samples over space and time and combine all of the samples to create like a synthetic aperture imaging, right? Just oh. like. Uh, uh, a SAR-based image used in in, in uh, marines or, or planes and flights and all that. Um, yeah. So, have you tried considered that? I have not, but that will be a very interesting um, project to think about, and also for underwater um, sonar sensing because the beam is very um, kind of narrow of the those uh, hydro uh, loudspeakers underwater. So I have to align them in a smart way to achieve the uh, desired beam using synthetic aperture system. Thanks. And the second question? 
Uh, so for the second question, I was wondering if you have compared your performance uh, with the uh, RF-based method, like using millimeter wave or other lower frequency RF signal. I have not, but that will be interesting to compare with that. Um, hi. Uh, so I have a question, this Amit. Um, when uh, there are many situations where you have both audio and uh, visual signals, right? I mean, your drone example for fire is uh, one example where, uh, you know, burning trees would uh, have both auditory signal and um, uh, visual signals. Um, have you seen, uh, come across applications where both should be combined for a, a better understanding? The computer vision and sonar sensing for forest uh, monitoring for that or forest or anything for that matter. I mean, um, in the autism uh, example, uh, you know, the parent is cooing the child uh, who is talking to the child or creating auditing sig signal as well as, uh, you know, visual signals. Mm, that's a good point. Um, it's it's an interesting direction for um, to do in the future and always good to have bimodal input. Yeah, and like if in the proposal of the forest um, uh, observation project is combined with computer vision, then it's 24 hour like mm. capable thing. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. And uh, would the, uh, well, I guess there's so much work going on in vision also. Are these um, yeah. very distant communities? Do they interact, do you know? Oh, not as I am aware of, but I know the CSEL and um, MIT, they have developed a great algorithm for uh, autonomous navigation using uh, visual uh, input. And they, they're, they're so, they're so, the, the programs are available to the public as well, their algorithms. So that's something to, to combine to my project. Hi, Chen. This is Jane. Hi, Jane. Hi, Chen. Thanks for coming. a great talk. Thank you Thank for you. Um, sharing that with us. Um, and I really appreciate your, your you know, consideration of how to apply all of the great tools that you have. Uh, I guess I wanted to follow up with one of your comments about using some of the deep learning and application to the behavioral you know, yes. paradigms for autism, maybe early detection and all of that. Um, I wondered about, I guess maybe it's a question about precision or maybe it's a question about like the mechanics, but I wondered if um, I could certainly imagine how it could apply to so, some elements like hand flapping, you know, that are part of the phenotype. Uh, but I wonder about if it would be sufficiently precise to pick up even um, facial uh, affect or sort of like, you know, um, eyebrows raised or, you know, frowns or sort of the way, um, individuals might respond just from um, facial, facial cues? Mm, yeah, that's a great question. I think that's also depending on how the cameras are set up to capture their facial movement. Maybe um, we can ask the parents to wear a camera on their, head, uh, on their head and use that to capture their child's facial movement. And, and also set up a few, the cameras does not have to be on the ceiling, but instead uh, having them hide it uh, like in the coffee cup, like those, like just around that interaction scene, will that be better to capture? Yeah, it's definitely a lot of experiments to try and find the best ways. Yeah, That's a great question. Well, those are good ideas. And I know that um, I use eye tracking as well as Jesse. And mm -hmm. right now, one of the big waves is to have wearable eye tracking, kind of as your suggestion, whether they're sort of in, embedded in glasses or sort of, you know, um, on a hat or something. So in other words, it's capturing sort of the interaction in a real time, naturalistic interaction, instead of just flashing maybe images or videos on a screen. Mm -hmm. So that would be great to have your sort of bio, biomechanical skills to actually um, develop and make these sorts of tools. Mm. Am I yeah. misattributing your skill set? Is that something <laughs> that's no, reasonable no, no. to think about um, crafting yeah. cameras in a way that would capture all of these dimensions? Yeah, 
um, I think it's possible, and there are very small cameras already, like uh, that can be used uh, with a small microprocessor called uh, Raspberry Pi or Arduino board. They're so small, like uh, uh, this big. So there are many ways like we can try. Even the parents' clothing can have some cameras. <laughs> yeah, so. It's, it's it will be interesting and I think it's solvable great with my skill set hopefully <laughs> exciting sorry one more question I again I follow up a little bit on the thermal aspects of your work is it possible to apply those to be able to detect um, either sweat sweating or heart rate as sort of an indicator of like autonomic function to integrate both physiological function with behavioral function? Well, that's a great point. I think it's possible. So for the sweat, is can we use thermal cameras? And those these are image processing as well. And the thermal cameras can be synchronized with the, the cameras. And then at the, then we have two dimensional information. Yeah, and that would be helpful. I think it's doable. Great, thank you. This is Tarma Gopal. Hello, Chen. Very nice, very nice presentation, and I'm, I was very um, uh, astounded on the thoroughness of your work. Uh, so I, I have I have the follow up question regarding biological measurements. So, so would you think that uh, the ultrasound could uh, penetrate the clothes? So, so one could have a device that measures, let's say, respiration, heartbeat, and and other other biological parameters for health purposes. Oh, that's a great question. I think for some frequency, for some specific um, just like uh, amplitude, it's I need to do some uh, literature search to do that. But I know that for dolphins, the when they are underwater, they can detect the mines. So the mines are covered by the sand. So their sound is able to penetrate the sand layer and reach the mine and then uh, the Navy trained those dolphins to do that, to detect the mine and get reward. So I think it's, um, it's interesting. It's, I just need to do some research about that. That's a I great point. That, that would be very, very good alternative for, for heartbeat or, or other biological signals measurements because currently uh, remote, like non-contact sensors, they use like... Um, millimeter waves like uh, Sanjeev uh, pointed out but the problem there is what I see from a um, safety perspective is that you expose the person to electromagnetic fields and when you want to monitor them 24 7 then the person is actually in under constant um, exposure mm. but I have another other other question maybe not directly related to your work but I just um, a few days ago read a recent paper from MIT lab where they discovered that uh, that uh, the by, by simulation models that uh, it's it might be possible to rupture COVID um, 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 shell, so so to, to destroy COVID uh, flying around by ultrasound, and they said that it's possible by 110 megahertz, 50 megahertz, and 25 megahertz. Um, so I, I thought it was a very very um, nice um, uh, research indication. Yeah, um, that's the frequency band I've never used, that kind of high frequency, but it will be, um, can, I, I, I think I didn't catch the, the project from MIT. What, any keywords about that I can search? I, I can send you the link later. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Oh, Any more? Um, there seems a question in the in the chat box. Uh, okay. Does does Raspberry Pi have a strength of hardware required? Uh, have the strength of hardware required? Is um, it Raspberry Pi because it's cheap and easily available. Or does it um, you know is it something oh. that is uh, powerful enough for some things you could do? In that case, it's uh, a very cheap vehicle to uh, do what you want. Mm, uh, the the if I share the screen again, 
the just a sec. The solar head that developed in the PhD uses Raspberry Pi. But I think I want to this one. This is if you see the knob, that little black box box yeah. is the Raspberry Pi. Uh -huh. And I think I'm not uh, I want want it to be better. So you see uh, the Raspberry for the sonar head, you need a Raspberry Pi and I have two miniature oscilloscope, one for emission, one for reception and uh, other parts. But so now I want to uh, fuse them in one board like sonar on one chip. So Raspberry Pi may not be uh, in, the, in my project for future sonar development, but I think it's quite powerful. And I have colleagues using Arduino board for different purposes. It's, it's quite good. Thanks. Uh, Chen, just to adding this in, Chen, this is Pankesh. Hi. Uh, so th thanks, thanks for your talk. Very interesting oh. talk. I was Thank just you. adding to a Kaushik questions, uh, Kaushik's questions. So Raspberry Pi is, rice, Raspberry Pi could have, now the new versions are available, which is a little bit more powerful. So that would be a one option. And then there are some devices like from NVIDIA like Jackson oh, yes. Nano, which can run and which can fuse uh, different data streams together. Mm. Running computer visions algorithms on a very powerful and very efficient way. Mm. Then Thank third you. dimension is also, mm. I could see that there are microcontroller MCU units have been evolved. And on the other side from AI side also, uh, now tiny ML community has evolved, which the main objective of those tiny able community to run uh, computer vision algorithms on resource constant devices, which costs around like $10, $15. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that would be also kind of an interesting research area where how you could deploy computational intensive algorithms on tiny microcontroller low cost devices. Oh, thank you. How have you heard JSON board? That's something like can conduct uh, deep learning on a small chip. You mean uh, NVIDIA Jetson Nano? I didn't I think, hear you. I don't, I don't know if it's NVIDIA or some other brain. It's called Jetson board. Jet yeah, Jetson, Jetson are there. And then there are some accelerators also, USB accelerator. So for instance, mm. somebody can plug your, somebody can let's say some want to increase the uh, computations Suppose somebody wants to increase the computational power of Raspberry Pi, then mm. there are accelerators like oh. Google Corals is there, then Intel, Intel mode Movidius mm. are the devices which you just need to connect those things on a USB drive and you will have extra computational power. Oh, yeah. So I've, for instance, you mm. don't need to even uh, need to buy a new devices. Let's say mm. if Raspberry Pi is not sufficient to, to mm. run your algorithm. You can add some new computational capability into existing hardware as well. Mm. That's a great point. Thank you for the input. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think uh, we, um, in that case, if there's no more question, we can wrap up uh, this talk. Uh, Chen, we, uh, I, can, I can say for sure, on behalf of everybody, uh, we thoroughly enjoyed and found it very effective, your talk. Uh, Thank you. And uh, I uh, also am pleased uh, with, uh, you know, very good participation across the campus uh, in from many disciplines. So uh, we'll continue the uh, conversations. I, I know some more people are uh, communicating with us and um, um, thank you very much. And thanks for all the participants uh, for showing up. Um, and, and uh, you know, show the support for this talk. Thank Bye you. All. Bye. Thank you. Thank you Hi, Marco. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Thank you. See, see some of you later today. <laughs> <laughs>